starring Walter Houston in The Colossus of Panama, an original radio play on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. The floor of the United States Senate, the year 1904. Oh, Mr. President, the shame of it. Billions of dollars, hard-earned dollars of American farmers and, and, and working people poured into a heated and fever-ridden jungle a thousand miles from our shore. Now, what do we ask? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the voice of the senior senator from Alabama speaking at the turn of the century. His subject, the Panama Canal, that great work which is so vitally important to us today in the defense of our hemisphere. Our play tonight will tell the story of William Crawford Gorgon, the man who made that work possible. It is called The Colossus of Panama and was written especially for this program by Robert Tolman. DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Walter Houston in the role of William Crawford Gorgas in The Colossus of Panama. <laughs> play opens, Alabama's Senator Morgan still has the floor. The name of this man, Mr. President, is God. I don't know this man. All I know is this. It cost him this man to kill one, not two, not a hundred, but two, but, but one tiny, harmless mosquito. Five dollars of the people's money. Yeah, five dollars to kill one mosquito. By telling this doctor, the Gorgas, if he's in the gallery listening, to meet me in my office at recess. And if he can justify this wanton wastage of the people's money to me, I will not speak on this floor again, on any subject. I yield the rest of my time, Mr. President, for a motion for a recess. If there is no objection, the Senate is recessed. As the senators leave the floor, the sergeant at arms come forward to clear the gallery. But still seated deep in his own thoughts is a mild-mannered gentleman in a white linen suit. He turns to his wife, who sits beside him. Well, my dear? I know how you must feel, William. If they had any conception of the importance of your work. The importance of my work. There are a hundred men who could do what I'm doing. It's the canal they're trying to sell cheap. And that's something I'll fight for. Uh, Dr. Gorgas. That's the tenant. They're clearing the gallery, sir. Shall you be meeting me this afternoon? Uh, yes. Uh, look after Mrs. Gorgas, will you? Yes, sir. I'm going to take up Senator Morgan's challenge. Now, will you remember? Don't lose your temper, please. No, don't you worry, my dear. I'm just going to set the senator straight on his facts. He says it is costing me $5 to kill one mosquito. I resent that. It doesn't cost $5. It costs 10 <laughs> Well, Colonel Gorgas, I've got a hand with you. You certainly are frank. $10 a mosquito, eh? Senator, if I were really frank, I would tell you that your speech out there today was a little short of peace. Uh -huh. Come, come now, Colonel. Let's not be melodramatic. You have your business and I have mine. My business is to save money for my constituents. Yours is to spend I have only one business, Senator. To see that the Panama Canal is built as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, I'm not even convinced it can be built, Colonel. The Spanish failed. The French failed. Now we're going to be made the goat. I tell you, Senator... The only obstacle to the canal is disease. Get rid of the mosquitoes, and you get rid of the disease. Yeah, supposing you do, will the canal ever actually repay what we put into it? We have enough merchant ships on both coasts as it is. Railroads are faster than boats. Why should we build a canal that only foreigners will benefit from anyway? There's only one flaw in that argument, Senator. What's that? Japan is building a navy. Oh, yeah. 
Teddy Roosevelt in his yellow car again. Supposing Japan attacked the Philippines with her new navy, or even Hawaii. We'd need every ship we could spare from the Atlantic. Japan would have won the war before we could get one capital ship around Cape Horn. Colonel Gorgas, I respect you as a doctor. As a prognosticator of wars, I do not. Your theory about the Japs is like your theory about mosquitoes. You have a phobia about small things, sir. Little bugs and little people. Very well, Senator. But let this be understood. Whether Congress appropriates the money or not, I shall continue to kill mosquitoes. And I think you will live to see that it is worth whatever it costs. How are you, Colonel Gothel? Well, Dr. Gorgas, welcome back to Panama. Have a nice vacation? Well, it was hardly... Well, let's just say it's nice to be back, eh? How's the work going? Slowly, too slowly. Another landslide here at Calabria last week. That's why I came over here to take personal charge of the whole job. Good, then you can help me. Anything I can do, Doctor. Uh, just step into my shack here and we'll talk. Thank you. Sit down, won't you? Sure. Now, uh, what's on your mind, sir? Uh, I've been looking over the records at the Anson Hospital, Colonel. Yellow fever is epidemic again. Yeah, it's the weather. Been damp, you know. Mm -hmm. Who ordered my mosquito-killing squad to start cleaning up the streets in the city? I did. Did you realize what you were doing? We have to face it, Gorgas. They can't kill all the mosquitoes. That's no excuse for not killing all we can. Gorgas, I know what you're trying to do. But something has to be done about the sanitary conditions in Colon and Panama City. If Congress ever sent a commission to investigate... Would you rather find they found a little filth and a few bad smells or everybody dead of yellow fever in the jungle growing over your fine machinery? Well, now, that's an exaggeration. Not at the present death rate of yellow fever and malaria. What do you propose that I do? Give me back my mosquito-killing squad. I can't do it. You're the only one who can, Colonel Gorsel. Well, you may as well know the truth, Gorgas. The Admiral said he would order our ships home unless something was done about the smell. I couldn't allow that to happen. Well, I can and I will. I see. Will you take personal responsibility for whatever happens? I will. If the epidemic should become worse, we might even have to stop operations, you know. Then I hope it happens. Then we will know that disease and nothing but disease is our obstacle. And that, Colonel Gothel, I can prove. William, you're late. What happened? Uh, they had to stop work at Calabria today. Men are afraid to work there. Too many down with a the fever there the past week. Does that mean the end of the canal? Well, not yet, no. Gothels are still hopeful. He thinks transferring Jamaicans over there, the ones that are immune to yellow fever, will solve the problem. What do you think? Well, it'll solve the yellow fever problem there for the moment, but not the malaria. I told them so. But they still expect me to fight it with a scrubbing brush and a bucket of whitewash. Oh, don't they know it's the mosquitoes and not the filth? Well, of course they know it, but they say there are too many of them. But it's hopeless. And I had to admit they were right. It does look hopeless. What are you going to do? I don't know. I have disobeyed orders. And I've refused to resign. <laughs> I can even be tried for manslaughter or heaven knows what. I have to go through with it. Oh, William. I'm so worried for you. Is there anything I can do to help? I wonder. Tell me, Ellen. Are you a good liar? William. Why do you ask? Because I'm going to disappear for about two weeks. Disappear? Yes. No, don't worry. I'll be right here in my laboratory. But nobody is allowed in nobody, you understand? Yes, sir. And another thing. Don't kill any mosquitoes you see about the house. Capture them alive and bring them into me. Mosquitoes? Well, I thought you already knew everything there was to know about them, William. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. I forgot that I'm a scientist. The canal seemed to mean so much more. Time seemed too precious to waste in research. But now... Yes? Well, I might have known all along. Nobody ever knows enough about anything. You 
are listening to Walter Houston as William Crawford Gorgas in The Colossus of Panama, an original radio play on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Two tiny mosquitoes. By name, Stegomaya and Anopolis. They were everywhere. Their strength had been greater than all the accumulated knowledge of mankind. Yet the faith and labor of one man stood against them. William Crawford Gorga. Hey, senor, what is it you want? I want to see your water pitchers. Oh, you are tourists. You wish to buy pottery? You like these big ones? Uh, let me see them all, senora. It may take me some time to find the one I'm looking for. Oh. Uh, Americano, who has a big job in the canal, yet spends his time examining water pitchers in the slum. Even the Americano is thinking strange. Nurse! Nurse! Yes, Dr. Gordon. Who put the pans of water under the bed legs in this ward? Why, the mother superior ordered it, doctor. It keeps the ants from crawling up on the bed. Well, get rid of them, do you hear? Throw them out. But, doctor... I haven't time to explain to you, just do as I say. And after this, no fresh water in the wards, except in covered vessels, understand? Yes, doctor. I'll take care of it immediately. He seems obsessed by the smallest details. In some quarters, his conduct is a scandal. My family are of the oldest nobility in the Panama. Now, what do you think this upstart has sent into my home? A sanitary squad. I tell you, I will not support this insult. I am Bangkok. Rude. The finest hotel in Panama. And this... Assassin! He puts black oil in my water supply. He drains my beautiful lagoon. Water lilies, swans, everything beautiful. I'll go to the authorities. My wife and I came here for a vacation. We haven't had a moment's peace. Restrictions, quarantine, searches, and seizures. You wanted to see me, gentlemen? Uh, yes. Uh, you know the Admiral, I believe, and uh, Commissioner Shunt? Yes, I do. Yes, sir, Commissioner. I assume you know the purpose of this meeting, Dr. Gorgas? No, but I am glad you asked me to come here today, gentlemen. I believe I have found the final answer to the problem that has confronted us. I think I have a way to eliminate not just a few, but all the deadly mosquitoes from the canal zone, and perhaps even from the entire Western Hemisphere. Yes. Dr. Gorgas, please, please, time is of the essence. I must get this information across to you quickly. Very well, Doctor. I only wanted to say... I, I'll say it later, Admiral. Gentlemen, I have thought, dreamt, and observed nothing for two weeks except the habit of two mosquitoes. I have developed a strategy which I believe will assure success in the battle against them. Not in a matter of years as he once hoped, but in a few months. A uh, strategy, Doctor? Colonel, when you go into a battle, what is the first thing you try to determine? Well, the weak places in the enemy's defenses is the rule. Precisely. Now, take the Stegemeyer, the yellow fever carrier. This mosquito has lived with mankind for so long, it has become over-civilized. It is squeamish. It will lay its eggs only in clean water. To deal with it, we will have to go into every house in the canal zone and insist that every vessel containing fresh water be tightly covered at all times. That sounds simple enough. But, uh, Dr. Gorgas, about this matter of invading people's houses... There have been complaints of a most serious nature. I expected there would be. You take a very cavalier view of the matter, Dr. Gorgas. And if I may say so, this nonsense about mosquitoes and water pictures is wild, simply wild. Gentlemen, please. You agreed to hear me out. <laughs> we uh, stand corrected. Uh, go on, Dr. Yes. Thank you, Colonel Gorgas. Our second enemy, gentlemen, is Anaphili, the malaria mosquito. It is, well, it's a little more of a problem. It will breed in any kind of water. Mud puddles, cow tracks, anywhere. Are you going to propose abolishing cows from the zone? <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, I have never been more serious in my life. Please give me a moment more. I'm sorry, Doctor. I won't interrupt again. Well, the malaria mosquito has a fatal weakness. It cannot fly more than 200 yards from its breeding place. Are you absolutely certain of these facts, Roger? I stake my reputation on them. Or what's left of it. And uh, that, uh, well, let's be candid. Is not much at the moment. 
However, if what you say is true, then it simplifies our problem. Then we shall have to enforce drainage for only 200 yards around the work and residential zone. It's worth trying, isn't it? Well, gentlemen, what do you think? Dr. Gorgas, let me say that I would like nothing better than to put you to work on this scheme of yours at once. Unfortunately, I cannot. But why not? The President of the United States is on his way to Panama at this very moment. I fail to see why that should interrupt our work. The President will be greeted when he arrives, Dr. Gorgas, by a filth and stench of Cologne and Panama City, caused entirely by your neglect of sanitation while you were preparing your scholarly treatise on the habits of mosquitoes. Then you refuse... You refuse even to let me start this work? I suggest that you wait, Dr. Gorgas, and discuss it with the president himself. The commission will naturally abide by his decision. And we are fairly confident of what that decision will be. Gentlemen, the president of the United States. Mr. President... Welcome to Panama, Mr. President. Fine, welcome. Rocky Street. Oh, dead cats in the street. No wonder all the men are dying. What's the excuse for this, struggle? Dr. Gorgas is in charge of sanitation, Mr. President. You'd better ask him. Gorgas, eh? You're Gorgas, aren't you? That's right, Mr. President. Yeah, you've got gray hair since Cuba, eh? Well, I don't wonder. Do you realize the whole country's up in arms against you? And me, too, because of you? Because of me? I started this whole project, mostly on your say-so. You said you could get rid of these smells, make this a fit place to live, like you did in Nevada. I cleaned up Havana, yes, Mr. President. I made the mistake of cleaning up Havana. Eh? Come, Polly, close that window, will you? Uh, Never heard anything like the racket down here. Now, what's that you were saying? I said cleaning up Havana was a mistake as far as the yellow fever was concerned. Mistake? Whitewash never killed one single mosquito egg, Mr. President. Well, maybe you're right. What about it, Douglas? Can you build this canal or not? Mr. President, if I could only be sure of a supply of healthy labor, then... Well, I'll get them. Never mind the cost. They won't work for us at any price. Oh. Scared, eh? You can hardly blame them. I'm a little frightened myself, Mr. President. What about you, Gorgas? You scared of this thing? <laughs> I've already had yellow fever, Mr. President. I'm immune. You must have a fine physique, sir. Dividing a thing like that? No, there are worse things than yellow fever, Mr. President. Seeing men die, for instance, when you know the way to prevent it. Then why don't you do something about it? They tell me you spend all your time oiling pools and stocking streams with fish. That's right. Tell me, what are the fish for, sir? Well, to put it simply, they eat the mosquito eggs. Before they can hatch out, eh? See, that's woolly. I must tell my son about that. How did you find that out? I watched them doing it. <laughs> that's really bully. Well, uh, Commissioner, I'll have to think all this over. Now, Mr. President, there's no time to think it over. Give me the authority. I can have the men back at work in a week's time. Delay even for one day and the epidemic will be out of control. You have got to decide tonight whether you're going to build the Panama Canal or not. Things are that bad, eh? Well, gentlemen, we'll build it. We've got to, believe me. I think Dr. Gorgas is my man. It's your decision, Mr. President. I'll take personal responsibility. Mind you, don't make a fool of me again, Gorgas. I think I can promise you results this time, Mr. President. Fully. Well, good day, gentlemen. And I want you men to get behind Gorgas, all of you. Those are my orders. Panama. Squads of men work feverishly against time and against the most relentless heat on the face of the earth, the steaming heat of the jungle. They cut back the brush, filling the stagnant pools that breed the carriers of death. Volunteers go ahead with tins of oil. And where they have walked, the freshwater streams show the mark of the Americano border. The little rainbow smear of oil on the surface of the water. Look, compañero. There it is again. Yes. This is fresh oil. They must be nearby. I hear them. Listen, they're just ahead. Hola. Hello. Oh, we found them. Come. Well, sir, we're certainly glad to see you. Uh, we have the food, Senor General. And the drinking water. And the letter. Ah, thank you. All right, men, you can knock off for a while. Lunch. Oh, oh. What a nasty job. How much longer are you going to keep us at this, Colonel? Until there's not one case of yellow fever at Anson Hospital. That'll be the millennium, won't it? That's just what it'll be, son. Senor General, uh, the letter. Aren't you going to read the letter? Oh, yes, yes. Thanks for reminding me. See, this heat's enough to knock you flat. What's the matter, bad news, sir? No, no, it's from Colonel Gothel. They start work today at Calibra, at noon. At noon? That's about 
One minute from now by my watch. Wonder if we can hear him. Yeah. Listen. <laughs> Sounds like the cannon in the old fort. No, sir, it's not. That's blasting. They've already begun. As Palabra, the men have returned to their post. Confident. Unworried. The great steel shovels whirl about like giant dinosaurs, bite into the stone flesh of the mountain. Yes, Sergeant. I have to report to The compound of Buster Bispo has been paved. Drainage and operation. Good. You may inform Colonel Gothel that work may be resumed at that side of the cut. Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant, arrange the transfer of your company to Chargers. The train leaves in the morning. The course of the Great River is forced into a new channel. An evacuated town of 10,000 souls is drowned in mud and silt. Silent brown skinned men and women, their pockets bulging with fifth American dollars, happily watch the destruction of the homes that have brought them on the misery. They will move into new white houses along the clean blue waters that will join the oceans together. Men, our battle is won. In a few days, standing on this hill at sunset, we will see the lights go on from Cologne to Panama. May they never be extinguished. But our job has only just begun. Now comes the most hazardous work of all. Only volunteers will go. We must go back into the jungle. We must follow every stream to its source. We must find the secret place, the endemic source of this disease. And there, we must destroy the one tiny class of insect that started the trouble. Who among you has the courage? To do this thing. I will, sir. Gentlemen, I salute you. Mr. President, General William Crawford Gorgas. Oh, bring him in, bring him in. Mr. President. General Gorgas, we meet under the most happy of circumstances. The troublesome old busybody, you don't know what that means. <laughs> Perhaps I know better than you imagine, Mr. President. Well, now tell me. How did you do it? I'll be frank with you, I never thought you would. It was the last resort by choosing you. Well, it's a long story, sir. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, what about those fish? My son was delighted with that story. Delighted. <laughs> well, we, we finally found where they came from. Stegamaya mosquitoes, I mean. It was a lake in Ecuador. And you put those fish in there, eh? And they just gobbled them up. Boy! <laughs> Tell you thing, Mr. President, that it always seems to be the same. When large numbers of people are plagued by some one trouble, it nearly always turns out to be a very small group somewhere that is causing all the misery. Just so. Take this Prussian military group in Europe. Don't trust them, never did. And these Japs. Now they have a bunch they call a samurai. That's what they're getting to be dangerous for. And it turns out to be the same way with yellow fever and so on. It's extraordinary. <laughs> Mr. President... We have a peculiar situation here. As a scientist, I've learned something from politics. And as a politician... Well, <laughs> let's not go into that. I spoke at the graduation exercise at Walter Reed Hospital the other day. And this is what I said. I'd like to repeat it to you now. I said, Gorgas is the Panama Canal. And the Panama Canal is Gorgas. And no man will ever get higher praise than that for me. That, Mr. President, is all that any man can ask. <laughs> Houston. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments, we will hear again from our star. In the meantime, we want to tell you a story of a chemical product necessary to the building of the Panama Canal and other great engineering projects in peacetime, as well as a vital force for increasing production in wartime. America, in the middle years of the last century, was an eager, vibrant young nation struggling to grow out to her wider boundaries. Struggling, but balked. Then in Switzerland, a man invented gun cotton. In Italy, another man invented nitroglycerin. In Sweden, a man discovered dynamite. 
and science placed in her hand the great mountain-moving lever that America needed. For America, DuPont manufactured this new explosive of tremendous strength. Promptly, the gold miners of California found they could shatter and move out of the way four times as much rock. Nevada silver miners doubled their production. Into the copper, the iron lands of Lake Superior went the new chemical tool, working mass miracles there. In the 1890s, iron production quadrupled. That of copper was multiplied nine times. Coal production increased five times. At last, Americans could use cement as a building material because dynamite made big-scale rock blasting practicable. Between 1870 and 80, 40,000 miles of railroad tracks were laid. And then in the 90s, trackage doubled. America grew to stature in a roar and thud of dynamite. There are old-time blasting men who remember the great nation-building jobs dynamite handled at the turn of the century, jobs never before possible, like the Panama Canal, about which you've heard tonight. Men who have worked with dynamite since canal days, grateful for its safety, impressed by the amount of work it does, see in it a chemical tool of infinite potentiality for mankind's benefit, both for today and for the future. At a critical period in America's expansion, DuPont responded with a product filling a vital need. DuPont has done exactly that consistently in a 140-year history that parallels the history of the nation. Dynamite is a prime mover. In peace, America uses a million pounds of it every day, 350 million pounds of the various types each year, produced by 25 companies in 42 plants throughout the United States. DuPont alone manufactures nearly 200 different types and grades of dynamite. Nitromon, to single out one blasting agent, is the safest known. Used especially in quarrying and oil prospecting, Nitromon can be held in a flame or riddled with rifle bullets without danger. In this war year, America will use an estimated 450 million pounds of dynamite. Dynamite is helping to produce more steel, more coal, more copper. Dynamite helps feed cantonments and airports, excavations and harbors. On one island outpost of the United States, dynamite is quarrying 20 million yards of rock for a single giant air base. Between British Columbia and Alaska, dynamite is helping to cut and surface a 24-foot roadway 1,500 miles long, the Alaska Highway. In the Tennessee Valley, dynamite has helped to bring power to our war industries from the great new dam, Norris, Hiawassee, Chickamauga, Cherokee, and the others, to say nothing of Grand Coulee and Boulder and Shasta of the Great West. At one Navy ammunition storage dump, it's helping build 3,000 igloos, as they're called, each one of which stores a quarter of a million pounds of ammunition. Bad news for America's enemies. DuPont Dynamite, weapons of production in wartime, in peacetime help to bring better things for better living through chemistry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like you to meet our star of the evening, Walter Houston. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I gratefully acknowledge that applause, not for myself or the cavalcade players, but for William Crawford Gorgon, whose unshakable faith in pursuing an idea made possible the great canal across the Isthmus of Panama. Today, as never before, we realize how great was his vision and foresight to the preservation of America and all things that are American. Thank you. Next week on The Cavalcade of America, DuPont will bring you an original radio play starring Paulette Goddard in The Lady and the Flag, a story of a great American woman, Betsy Ross. The orchestra and musical score on this program were under the personal direction of Don Bury. Don't forget, next week on Cavalcade, Paulette Goddard in The Lady and the Flag. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from the DuPont Company. <laughs>